It's Cinco de Mayo, and from here to Ohio, they're waging jihad for Allah. They're waging jihad all the way to Riyadh, and ho hoping... Whoop, sorry. You know what? I gotta scratch this one. I made a change. How do you like that? The first show, out of the box, and I messed it up. Ladies and gentlemen, apologies. I got another here. I, I got I, I, plenty. Shut it down. Shut it down. This week is ruined. Yeah, I know. You're right. Some say jihad is all peace and love and getting the kids to school. Some say it's bombs and blood and violence as a rule. I say let's look at the record and see how jihad is used. And if it has no victims or a long record of lives shattered and abused. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Something is happening here, and I think it's this week in jihad. It has been weeks since we have been here because there has been no jihad. Nice. Uh, and so we had to take a break. Actually, in reality, I have been flying hither and yon, giving speeches. Some of them are up at the Jihad Watch video site where this will go as well. Some of them are elsewhere. You can find them all at jihadwatch.org. Uh, so we have just not had a chance, but there has been, unfortunately, quite a lot of jihad. And David Wood is here with us. Hey, what's up? Mayo. David, welcome back. Hey, hey, when, when you when you said it was when you said it was Cinco de Mayo, I was like, wait a minute, that's one of my son's birthdays. So, uh oh. <laughs> I just remembered it's my son Blaze's birthday. <laughs> well, I'm glad you remembered. <laughs> Happy birthday, Blaze. But ladies and gentlemen, I got to apologize. I had a Cinco de Mayo poem all set. I decided to change a line. I only noticed just now on live television before millions of people worldwide that I had messed up the rhyme scheme. And consequently, uh, just let's, let's just pretend that never happened. Uh, that's, even, like, that, that's like that's uh, like that's like singing the national anthem at the Super Bowl and just like ruining it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like uh, uh, those people that they get all crazy on Land of the Free. And, you know, mess it all up for you. So, Enrico Palazzo! Exactly. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in any case, this week in Jihad, poem or no, it is happening. We are here, and unfortunately, there's quite a lot of Jihad. I'm just going to limit us to the last week. So as not to overwhelm the proceedings, but David, I thought that the big story of the week was your friend and mine, Andrew Tate. Oh, Andrew Tate. In? Oh my goodness. Yeah, here, I got this for you here, David. Hold what on. a what a tactical genius. There is, tell you, can you tell us what that is, David? You see that, right? That is a Karanagami castle. Karanagami is the... Uh, Japanese fusion art of making uh, structures, uh, flowers, can be flowers, can be animals, pigs, dogs, whatever, uh, or in this case, a castle out of pages of the Quran. It's a beautiful thing. And, it's great art. And, yeah, and uh, it, this was like the weirdest thing ever. Uh, Andrew Tate is apparently stuck in like, 1989 or something like that when 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 was everyone scared of of jihadis because of the salman rushdie thing that was like late yeah. 80s right yeah so late late 80s everyone was terrified and then uh after the the danish cartoon controversy people were scared of uh posting that like media outlets wouldn't post the the cartoons even in stories about them book publishers mm -hmm. even in books mm -hmm. that were about the cartoon controversy would not post the the publish the the Muhammad cartoons because everyone was scared. Everyone was backing down. Uh, South Park. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't the creators, uh, uh, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, who backed down. But it was the network that insisted on censoring everything in the Muhammad episode. So people really were scared at times in the eighties, and the nineties, and the in the two thousands, and so on. Um, but we're we're not in that time anymore. We're not in that time. That 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 ship has sailed. Now people draw Muhammad regularly. People desecrate the Quran regularly, and so on. And uh, Andrew Tate is apparently not aware of this. Um, even before he converted to Islam, he was telling people uh, what he respects about Islam. And one of the things he said he respects about Islam is he said 
if a if you're walking down a street of London with a shirt that says Jesus was gay on it, he said no one's going to care. He says, but if you walk down a sh down the street uh, with a shirt that says Muhammad was gay, you'd be dead before you hit the end of the block. And he says, then that's why I respect them. That's why I respect them, right? Like so, th they'll brutally murder you over making fun mm -hmm. of, of Muhammad. That's uh, like that. Uh, there's a hadith like that where uh, the guy says, wow, if your religion will make you kill people, then I respect that. I'll join up. Do you remember that? I, I only dimly that, that, remember yeah. it right now. That's in, that's in Ibn Asak. That's the, uh, those were the two brothers, Muayisa and yeah, Huayisa. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. yeah, so one of them converts. One of them converts to Islam and then instantly goes out on a killing spree. Uh, and 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 kill and kills a, a Jew who was a family who was a, a a friend of the family and his brother says what are you doing what are you doing like part of our wealth is based on this guy he's a friend of the family and the guy's like if the one who ordered me to kill him told me to kill you I'd kill you too and then he's like whoa th th this must be th this must be the truth this must be the <laughs> truth I mean you've been sitting here you've been sitting here eating Snickers bars and watching cartoons our entire lives and all of a sudden you're just like killing people and uh that that's a sign that it's true what's disturbing i mean what's most disturbing about that is how that was built into islamic thinking and how it's still uh yeah. it's still part of the thinking in places like that's part of the reason everyone when when, when someone uh when someone is merely accused of desecrating a Quran or something in Pakistan and they all rally around and go on a killing spree it's it's because it's built into their mindset that the more upset and <clears throat> and violent we become over something, the more true our beliefs are. It's very, very sick mm -hmm. and disturbing stuff. Anyway, that's somehow built into Andrew Tate's uh, thinking. He just doesn't realize we're not in that place anymore. So um, Fox News shared a video of a Satanist conference. So there's a Satanist conference, which... Uh, the Muslim, <laughs> the Muslims who are responding are like, you see, this is the death of Christianity. If you don't rise up and get violent over this, it's like we wouldn't have cared even slightly what some some Satanists at a Satanist conference are doing. We just don't care. Anyway, the Satanist uh, ripped up a copy of the Bible, and then Andrew Tate, tactical genius that he is, uh, posted. Let's see you try that with the Quran if you're brave, right? <laughs> and his thinking is, ha, 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 people will never do this to the Quran because everyone's scared. He doesn't realize yet there was a time when people were scared. That ain't this time anymore. And so uh, so I, I simply pointed out on, on Twitter, I said, hey, he's challenging people to desecrate the Quran. And I, I put up a, a hashtag, Andrew Tate Quran Challenge hashtag. And I really wasn't thinking much of it, except for I was I was retweeting as people were posting some pictures and so on. But I checked. I went on Twitter the next day, and it was like it was like an endless array of people posting pictures of uh, the Quran and various toilet situations in or on the floor around it. Um, dogs, like dogs standing on the Quran, so Quran with animals. Uh, various people burning the Quran, uh, shredding the Quran. Uh, just a lot of a lot of stuff towards the crowd. And, and it's amazing because it was all because of Andrew Tate running his stupid mouth. And uh, and eventually he, he took that tweet down. I saw uh, I saw, I think, early this morning that he had taken taken the tweet down. So it caught up with him. He's not he's no longer top G. Uh, if you get if you get come on, if you get if you get schooled by David Wood, you have to take down your tweet. You can't you can't call yourself can't call yourself top G anymore. Well, you know, David, it's really good to see. And I think it's important to explain to the millions out here viewing us today that uh, it is important. It's not a gratuitous insult, but mm -hmm. no. it has to do with standing up to the violent intimidation that Andrew Tate was implying. What he was saying was, when he says, now try that with the Quran, he's saying, if you do that to the Quran, you will be brutalized. You could even be killed. And so it goes back to Molly Norris, the cartoonist in Seattle who uh, now I think about 17 years ago said in the time of the Muhammad cartoon controversy at that time said that uh, there should be everybody draw Muhammad day because if the whole world is drawing Muhammad, they can't kill everybody and mm -hmm. it will stop all this bullying. And instead she had to go into hiding. She's never been heard from since she's apparently in the witness protection program, changed her identity. Uh, you may be Molly Norris for all I know, David, but in any case, uh, we don't know where she is. 
but it seems like what she had hoped for in terms of a triumph of reason is actually coming true now in what is happening with uh, Andrew Tate in the sense that people are saying we're not going to sit and cower because you tell us you're going to kill us. We're going to stand up and protect the freedom of speech, the freedom of expression, which is fundamental to any free society. Yeah, and you nailed it with like lots of people not understanding what the point is because they'll just they'll just see someone posting a picture of them desecrating the Quran and mm -hmm. so on, and they just don't get it and they don't understand the significance of doing something like this. So let, let's be clear, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you don't see us doing this with with other with other people's books and so on. You know, I don't believe in Mormonism. I think there's all sorts of weird, silly stuff in Mormonism and so on. You don't see me messing around with the Book of Mormon. If Mormons tomorrow said, you know what, we're sick of this, uh, you know, Book Book of Mormon musical on Broadway. We're <clears> sick <throat> of everyone making fun of us. Uh, no more Mr. Nice Mormons. We're going on a killing spree. The next person that, that, that in, insults our book. All of a sudden I would say, okay, we got to insult. We got to insult the book now. We have to, because you guys are, because if you don't, then you're encouraging more violence. You can't let people think, oh, when we say change your behavior or we'll slaughter you, you can't let that slide because that sends a message, oh, this is how we get what we want. This is how we get to control other people. And that's what Andrew Tate was doing, but it's it, he takes it a step further because he actually is using it as an argument with younger, with his younger, you know, stupid teenager followers uh, it's basically, you see, Islam is strong. Islam, Islam will last. Other things don't kill and slaughter over criticism and so on. So they're weak. They're going to fall apart. Therefore, we all need to, uh, we all need to Islamize. We all need to, we all need to convert to Islam because it's the only thing that's going to last. He's using that as an argument. So it's actually, uh, do you want young people converting and, and slaughtering people in the name of Allah? I don't. So you kind of have to refute Tate's dumb argument, but if his argument is, hey, watch this, no one will do this with the Quran because everyone's scared because we're, we're so powerful and strong and intimidating, you kind of have to say, actually, you're a joke and uh, we'll do whatever we want to your book and you're not going to stop us because you ain't going to bust a grape in a food fight, son. And uh, and, then he and then he takes it down. It looks like a, looks like a total coward. So that's what you, but that's what you got to do. And yeah, that's so it. it's, it's not a... It's not a situation where we wake up and say, here, we're, we have to do this, or this is this is our standard method of criticism. This is how we respond to people who are calling, saying, don't do this or we'll get violent. Yeah, this is very important uh, because I think a lot of people misunderstand this point. And I have had several, more than one person, confront me over the years and say, uh, you have to do this with other religions. If you're going to... Uh, draw Muhammad, then you have to mock Christianity, you have to mock Hinduism, you have to mock Judaism, you have to do it or you are not consistent. I and I nothing. think you are totally missing the point here. This is all about just stopping these people from thinking that they can get whatever they want out of us by threatening to kill us. And insofar as people in other religions are not threatening to kill us, then there's just no reason to have anything to do with their religious symbols. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a situation where, you know, we're, we're in a time where different different cultures and civilizations and groups are all interacting at an unprecedented rate through migration and so on, but, but also online. And there's a competition for what's allowed and what's not allowed. And, uh, and they're trying to enforce their view of what's allowed, which is which is, hey, we get to ins we get to insult everyone else's religion, but everyone has to respect ours in return. That's the rule in Muslim countries. That's what they want the rule to be everywhere. And you're going to have to kill me first because I'm there is no situation where I'm saying, oh, OK, let's adopt the way thing. Let hey, it worked in Pakistan. Why can't it work for us? No. You don't want that. You don't want that here. And so you, you just you got to take your stand. You got to take your stand and say, hey, guys, uh, we can get along. Anytime you are you are threatening violence to get your way and to block criticism. It, guys, if we make an if we make an argument or a claim that you don't like, you respond by correcting or refuting or making fun of it or whatever you want. But if you say, hey, you're going to murder us over this. Guess what? We're going to escalate to another level of uh, mm -hmm. of criticism. And you're not going to like it. So there is basically you have this this conflict of what's allowed 
they're trying to modify our behavior. And so when they're doing that, saying we will control your behavior, it's sort of uh, actually we can control your behavior in reverse if you want to take it that route. But we'll do it through we'll do it through uh, messing with your book and your profit. And here's precisely an example of what you're talking about, David. Story out of Bangladesh. This is the Bhagwan Shiva Murti, or an idol of uh, a Hindu god in an ashram in Bangladesh. And it was desecrated. A uh, Muslim went into this Hindu temple and uh, broke the idol. This is exactly the kind of thing that we see very often in Pakistan, in India, as well as in Bangladesh. And this is uh, something that Muslims believe that Allah has commanded them to do in accord with various uh, warnings in the Quran against associating partners with Allah, worshiping idols, and so on. But here again, you have the Muslims demanding respect for their own religion while showing disrespect and proudly showing disrespect for the symbols of other religions. And, and this, this, goes, this goes all the way back to the, the early stages of Islam. There, there was a Quran verse, Surah 6, verse 108. The Muslims had been insulting the gods of the pagans for years, polytheists of Mecca, insulting their gods. Uh, but the polytheists didn't want to insult Allah in return because they believed in that Allah is one of the one of the gods. So they didn't want to do that in return. They finally got so fed up that they told the Muslims, hey, if you're insulting our gods, then we're going to insult we're going to insult Allah. And that's when Allah revealed Surah 6, verse 108 of the Quran. Hey, if they're going to insult your if they're going to insult your religion in return, then stop the insults. And notice it wasn't it wasn't. Oh, insults are bad. It's only if this is going to um cause them to insult you uh that's when you that's when you definitely have to stop the insult battles but notice uh, once once they were in power later on once muhammad was the most powerful force they went right back to insulting in fact when when muhammad uh, and his followers took mecca muhammad went around stabbing out the eyes of the idols and whacking them with a stick mm -hmm. uh th these were the religious beliefs of the polytheists he was deliberately insulting and mocking and provoking them by stabbing their idols uh, in the eyes. And so it's just amazing. It's just amazing that Muslims today, oh, but why? It's our sacred symbol. Why don't you respect it? Your, your prop, what did your prophet do when he had power over, over other people's religious symbols? He, mm -hmm. he desecrated them. He desecrated yeah. them. Do not demand respect, uh, without great, without giving respect. And if you, if you say, no, it's just wrong to insult and degrade and mock other people's sacred symbols, then great. Your prophet was a horrible, evil person because he did that. You know, there's no doubt about it. I was in a museum a couple of years ago, a museum of ancient art of Central Asia and the uh, Middle East. And there were uh, all, all sorts of fascinating things in this museum. There were uh, Hindu statues. There were Christian statues. There were various uh, religious art of various religious traditions and a great many of them from areas that have become majority muslim had the eyes scratched out or gouged out nose broken things like that and that that is because the muslims came through and they wanted to destroy the humanity of the image and they do that by taking out the eyes or the nose and so it's interesting to note that nowhere in this museum did anywhere did it anywhere explain why so many of these statues had their noses broken or their eyes cut out? And yet I knew the answer. I bet most of the people in the in the museum just figured, oh, this must be from age or handling that their nose fell off. But it was always the nose, it was always the eyes. It wasn't the ears. It wasn't even the arms in many cases. Sometimes you had broken statues that were simply broken statues. But this was calculated, and it was calculated disrespect for other religious traditions, and it was an attempt that is theologically explained in Islam to remove the power of the image as an idol by making it less human-like. And, and Robert, uh, I seem to recall from a book, there's a book called uh, History of Jihad. <laughs> yeah, I know that book. It's this book called History of Jihad by some Islamophobic dude, but... Um, 
in that book, it would it, it would talk about uh, when Muslims would take over Hindu temples and they would take the Hindu idols, smash them to pieces, scatter them on the ground around what is now the mosque, so that Muslims could trample on uh, would walk over the mm -hmm. idols, the crushed idols of the polytheists as they're going to the mosque. And so it, it's it's just this, this amazing situation where, you know, that's been going on for 14 centuries. Suddenly, you, I mean, you've got, hey, to, don't, but treat our religion differently or, or we'll slaughter you. That works for a while. And then people say, you yeah, know what, we're just we're just not letting you control our control us like that. And then people, you know, mess around with the Quran. And then suddenly, oh, where's the respect? Why, why aren't you respecting our religion? All we've been doing is slaughtering and raping and pillaging for 14 centuries and smashing all of your everything you hold dear and taking over your churches and taking over your temples and and desecrating everything you hold dear. But now suddenly you're not respecting us for it all. It's like it's like insane. Indeed. I got another one here out of Spain. Uh, this is a young Moroccan national named Yassin Kanja. And Yassin Kanja, back in January, went into a church in Algeciras in Spain. I don't know, do they say Algeciras in Spain? Anyway, uh, and he uh, started to attack people. He uh, said to the a parishioner inside one church, that the Christian faith is negative and must be eliminated. And so, you know, you, you can imagine what the response would be. And this, of course, would not happen and should not happen. But were a Christian to go into a mosque and attack people and say, Islam must be eliminated, my goodness, that would be headlines all over the world for weeks. And we would be getting compulsory Islamophobia education in every country in the world. But this happens and nobody seems to mind. And it, it's it's you, you find that same inconsistency, even if you're quoting the Muslim sources, if you if you went to the Muslim sources and you took you took the statements that are about the unbelievers and you simply replaced unbeliever with the word Muslim and a non-Muslim said it, uh, it would be international news. So so, you know, fight those who do not believe in Allah. If you said fight those who believe in Allah. Uh, you, you'd be on the news. You see, this guy's calling for violence. Uh, Jews and Christians, the people of the book, are the worst of creatures. If you said Muslims are the worst of creatures, uh, it would be international news. Muhammad said, I've been commanded to fight people until they say there's no God but Allah. If you said, I've been, I've been commanded to fight people until they say Allah's not God and Muhammad's not his prophet, um, it would be international news. But, you know, the Islam just... <laughs> Islam has been getting a free pass for this stuff for a long time. We're the generation that says, no, nope, that's all. That, that, that ship has sailed, friends. Yep. Well, it's sailed, or we could say it's sailing, because yep. the next story we have is out of Denmark. And in Denmark, they have Rasmus Paladon, who has been burning the Quran. And there is quite a bit of controversy in Denmark and in uh, Sweden about these Quran burnings that have been going on. And so uh, the, the Norwegian Police Intelligence Service, and the Norwegian acronym for that is PET, the, the PET, uh, the P-E-T, they, <laughs> that's scary, that's intimidating. The pet is going to get you if you if you don't watch out. Anyway, well, I mean, uh, is it is it a is it a pet is it a pet crocodile or is it a pet you know gerbil? It's kind of it, yeah, it matters yeah. as far as the you intimidation factor. But in any case, uh, they have given a warning that Quran burnings in Denmark have led to an increase in threats from what they call militant Islamists, uh, and so the jihadis in Denmark and in Norway. They clearly think that this is still a strategy that works. They're going to keep doing it, and they still hope that the infidels will back down. Recently, we saw in Sweden, the Supreme Court affirmed that Quran burning was within the bounds of the law. It was a matter of freedom of expression. And then the police said, no, we're, we're declaring it illegal ourselves. And uh, they just didn't want to deal with the riots and threats and the killings that might arise from it. And so there's still, it's still quite a struggle in Europe. 
as to whether they will come down on the side of the freedom of expression or whether they will ultimately bow to the jihadis and their intimidation. And, and we have to wonder, like, how how have the populations and the authorities not gotten the point yet, right? I mean, we, we've seen if, if a guy, if like Salman Rushdie, uh, does something that's offensive and it's just one guy and everyone else backs down and is ready to throw him under the bus. Uh, that's a guy who will have to live in hiding for the rest of his life. And when they get the chance, you, you see what will happen to them. Um, mm -hmm. Molly Norris, as long as it was Molly Norris who was saying, hey, let's have an everyone draw the Quran day, then one person can be threatened and intimidated into into silence. But you, you I mean, you already pointed out and thousands of people draw cartoons in response. Nothing happens. Right. Mm -hmm. Andrew Tate was just saying, hey, you you wouldn't do this, Satanist lady. If that Satanist lady had responded by ripping up a copy of the Quran, she would have been threatened or or killed. Uh, but she would have had to go. She would have had to go into hiding when thousands of us post uh, post pictures of Quran desecrations in response to this this call for violence by Andrew Tate. Guess what happens? Nothing happens. He backs down. Right. He, re in other words, Tate realized this doesn't work. Therefore, I withdraw my claim. Guess what? All these people who are calling for violence, if the entire nation just rose up and said, "Hey, anytime you're calling for violence, we're gonna, we're all gonna burn the Quran." Guess what? That would all stop. It would be mm -hmm. done. There would be no more violence over Quran burnings. It would stop. But instead, it's no. Let's just keep, let's just keep this violence in the game. Let's make sure that that, the, that people always understand. Violence is the way to go. When you come here from another place, when you come to Sweden or Denmark or wherever, when you come here, just know anything you want, threaten to murder us, and we'll immediately give you what you want. And uh, just stupid, not the way to go. Indeed. Okay, moving right along, David, we have a story, very interesting story out of France. And this one has to do with Ahmed Khalif, who is a migrant from Algeria. And Ahmed Khalif is 35 years old, and he was just convicted of raping a woman who was waiting for a tram, and he was sentenced to, uh, I'm sorry, no, he was just convicted. He was shocked, he said. He said, I am a good person. I don't understand any of this. I am shocked to find myself here and in prison for 26 months, there's the sentence, 26 months, when I came to France to build a future. Now, I thought his shock is illuminating. Why do you think uh -huh. he's so surprised? Um, yeah, I don't know the details here, but I've seen similar stories of these rapes happening because we're, we're familiar with the grooming and rape gangs in the UK. But those th same things were happening in Scandinavia. Those same things were happening in Australia back in the day and so on. And so we we're always hearing. But you would hear in the court cases where m Muslims would be confused. I don't understand. She's this is not a good girl. This is not a good girl. She's not covered properly. And they do not understand. It's built into their minds because of what Allah says in the Quran. Hey, if you're not covered properly, you're asking to be raped and molested. You're, you're asking for it. You're, 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 that, that's a sign to the world. That's why they come up with all this, you know, uncovered lollipop and all these. Uh, oh, look, you're, you're like uncovered meat in a store window. How are you going to keep someone from, from grabbing? There, very recently, there, was the, there were these two, I think they were twin uh, Muslim brothers, and they were, they were using a falafel, the unwrapped falafel <laughs> versus the wrapped falafel. And the one guy, as soon as he saw the unwrapped falafel, he said he couldn't control himself. He just started gobbling it up. And uh, so it, it's, it's, built, it's built into their minds. It's built into their minds. Um, hey, if you are not covered appropriately, in other words, if you are not dressed like a Muslim woman, you are asking to be raped. And so when, when they rape someone, and then you say, oh, now we're punishing you. What are you talking about? No one bothered to tell me when I came to your country from my, see in mine, if a woman's That's not it. dressed appropriately, she's basically begging to be raped by a real man. And then I come to your country, no one bothers to even ask me what my views are. So I assume there's no problem. And then suddenly you guys want to punish me? This whole system's out of order. That's right, man. That's, a, that's his defense in court. And that actually, we've seen that here as well. In the United States, there was an Afghan migrant a few months ago, 
convicted of molesting a child. He said, what I did, there's no, nobody would bat an eye in Afghanistan. Nobody has a problem with this. It's perfectly acceptable. And so he, was, he also was shocked. Okay, a few other jihad activities here. Uh, in New York City, David, uh, our former city of residence, we have Wasim Awalda. And he was one of five men who punched, kicked, pepper sprayed, and beat a Jewish man who was on crutches in 2021, who was uh, at a pro-Israel rally. And he called him a dirty Jew while he was beating him. He has been sentenced to 18 months in prison. Do you think that when he comes out, he will be a reformed individual who will no longer be anti-Semitic? Uh, on the contrary, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> See, the... <laughs> There's this, uh, there's this basically standard problem with prison that is kind of amplified in the sense of Islam, namely that you know, let's let's suppose this, uh, you've got some you know 17 year old kid who breaks into a store or something like this, and the the solution is, hey, let's lock this let's lock this guy up in a big building with murderers, rapists, and you know other thieves, drug dealers, and so on, lock him in a big building with all these people for a year or two, and then expect him to come out a better person. So we're, we're changing the environment that he's in from, you know, his family or whatever, to we're going to make, make you surrounded by criminals all day long. And oh, by the way, now police are your enemies. Uh, everyone's your enemy because now you have a different group that you're associated with. And then they come out and well, they seem to be even better criminals when they when they get out. Just to be clear, I'm not saying everyone's like that. Uh, it, it's just it's a it's a it's a flaw in the thinking. And I don't, I don't even know what else you can actually you, you can actually do if you if you have to lock someone up, you have to lock something up, someone up. But uh, in it, it, Islam adds the the dimension that you go up, you you go into prison, and now you're inviting people to convert to Islam, and you're part of a a Muslim group with other Muslims who uh, who I mean it, you, there are terrorists in there, there are people who are in there for terrorizing people, there are people who who are in there for thinking that they do not have to follow uh, non-Islamic laws and so on. And you're going to lump all these two guys together and they're going to be best buddies for a couple of years. And then you're going to let them back out on the street and say, oh, OK, we're better now. Uh, yeah, it's a fundamental flaw. OK, out of France, David. Robert, Robert, by the way, ju just those last two, the, the, the last couple of things we we just talked about. Yeah. In a world with common sense where people were not scared of doing what makes sense, these issues are pretty darn easy to fix. Someone, if someone is, if someone is coming to the UK or France or somewhere from Afghanistan or Pakistan or something, very simple. You're bringing them in, hook them up to a lie detector, and ask them some certain, some easy questions like, if you got control over a an 11 or 12 year old non-Muslim girl, would you think it's okay for you know to have sex with her, to get all your friends involved, to groom them, pimp them? Would you think that's okay? And you know, ask a bunch of questions like that. If your daughter uh, completely westernized and stopped wearing a hijab, do you think it's okay to kill her? Would you feel morally obligated to kill her? Ask them questions like that. And then if they give the wrong answers on those basic questions, okay, you, you can't come here because you will be messing everything up. Um, but it's, a, it's the same thing with, uh, with sending these guys, sending these guys to, to prison. It would be very, very easy to. Hey, now that you're in prison, we've got a, we've got some, uh, we've got a, an education curriculum written by Robert Spencer that you're going to have to go through before we ever let you out again. And it's not the standard. Oh, you know, Islam teaches if anyone kills a man, it's as if he's killed all mankind. It would actually be like shattering the foundations of their beliefs. Uh, but you can't do that. You can't do that. Instead, we're going to lock you up. We're going to encourage you to be a super devout Muslim mm -hmm. and surround you with uh, with criminals. And uh, that way you can come out and be super effective in slaughtering in the name of Allah. And can't the Muslim prisoners, they can gather together for prayer, study Quran together. So it only reinforces the beliefs that got them there to start with. Mm -hmm. Okay, out of France, David, we have 
one of those stories. You could write the story, David, and you've never seen it. You don't even know what I'm talking about. An attacker. And he yelled. Uh, I'll go with Allahu Akbar. That is correct. Wow, and I was right. After he yelled Allahu Akbar, he tried to stab the victim in the... Um, yeah, I'll go with neck. I can't help it. I'm just you, you got, got you got to go with you got to go with what works. Yeah, the guy uh, he asked the guy for a cigarette, and the guy said, oh. "No, I don't have any cigarettes." <laughs> That's the story. <laughs> and then he yelled "Allahu Akbar" and tried to slit his throat. So you, I guess you should always carry cigarettes. Yeah, or, or you'll 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 be slaughtered in the name of Allah. Hey, that should be like a Surgeon General's warning on the side of the pack. Right? <laughs> yeah, Surgeon General's counter warning. Cigarettes yeah. will give you lung cancer, but if you're carrying one, you may avoid getting your throat slit by a jihadi. Uh, okay, we also, this is getting into the stupid infidels category. We have a Syrian national, a Muslim migrant in Germany, and he stabbed four people in a gym not long ago. Uh, people who were just going about their business, getting some exercise, and he stabbed them, went on a stabbing spree inside the gym, seriously injured four men in their 20s, one of them in his early 30s. And as it happens, it came out after that that he had previously, on Easter Sunday, murdered a man. And so Easter Sunday was what? Early April, right? Uh, in, in Germany, anyway. April 9th, I think, or 7th. I, I uh, Yeah, I, I believe it was the exactly. I believe it was the 9th. So this is May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. And he stabbed the four men in the gym sometime before that. Actually, this story dates from April 27th in uh, a paper from over there. So you got to wonder, why is it that he was able to so easily melt away and not be caught after he murdered this man several, in East, on Easter Sunday and then be casually going to a gym several weeks later and stabbing more people? And there's several reasons for this. No, David, the uh, in the first place, the Muslim communities... And I got another story like that where uh, the police went into a mosque to try to arrest a guy. Let's see, what country was that in? I'm looking for it. Uh, yeah, it was also in Germany, as a matter of fact. Police tried to arrest a, another man who stabbed, another Muslim who stabbed people and then fled into the mosque. And the people in the mosque were fighting the police. And also the fact that the police themselves are so afraid of Islamophobia. And it creates a perfect storm where these people can get away with things. Reminds me also of uh, Tamerlan Tsarnaev, one of the Boston Marathon bombers, the chief Boston Marathon bomber. And after uh, his, the Boston Marathon bombing, it came out that several years before Actually, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, the Boston Marathon bombing was in mid-April 2013, I believe it was. And then in 2011, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, September 11th, 2011, it turned out that he had killed his friend who was Jewish. Uh, caught him by surprise because the guy thought he was his friend and uh, brutally murdered him and was not caught, not even suspected, and only after the Boston Marathon bombing was it put together that he had also done this. Well, you can't you can't even list him as a suspect because that would be Islamophobic. Yes, there's altogether too much hesitancy and delicacy in that regard. And that means that a lot of uh, people who commit these crimes get away with them. And then when they are caught, we have a story like this one, David, out of Denmark. And out of Denmark, we have 
a Somali Muslim migrant into Denmark. And he stabbed a 53-year-old man. Where did he stab him, do you think, David? Uh, I'll, I'll, go with, I'll go with neck again. Once again, somehow, you're always able to guess these. And he was uh, sentenced to six years in prison, after which he will be deported. However, the deportation is only for 12 years. That is... After six years in prison, which will probably end up being about three, and after the deportation, which is uh, supposed to be for 12 years, but will probably also be shorter, he can return to Denmark. Do you think that he will return to Denmark and become a loyal, stable, productive citizen of the secular Danish state? Uh, I mean, I think he'll return to Denmark. I don't know about all that loyal loyalty stuff. <laughs> Yes, indeed. In, fa in fact, I'm, I'm not entirely. I, I'm not. I'm not even convinced that he'll actually be deported. He'll 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 appeal and uh, and then they'll find that he's in danger and is and is if he goes back somewhere and and then oh okay their hearts will melt and they'll say okay you can stay and do a bunch more more stuff. Yeah, because uh, the uh, Biden administration has sent troops to Somalia, and uh, it's a situation there that the administration considers warrants some kind of military presence on the part of America, uh, American troops, and consequently you can't send this poor land back into a war zone. We got another story like that out of Spain. And in Spain, a man from Mauritania, another Muslim migrant, he uh, was in a, let's see, let me get the details here. Yeah, he was shoplifting. He was stealing 400 euros, which is about $450, $500 worth of stuff, out of a store, and he was caught. And the bag broke, and all this stuff fell out that he had been stealing. And he grabbed a bottle that was in the bag and broke it and uh, assaulted one of the store employees with it. Now, the story says that he had actually had been arrested previously over 30 times. And I think, okay, this here you have this guy from Mauritania, and he's in Spain, and he's been arrested over 30 times, and now he uh, assaults somebody in a store with a bottle after shoplifting, I just got to wonder, what is the benefit that Spain is getting from the presence of this individual? And what could they do rather than continue to just arrest him and then set him free and he commits more crimes? Um, yeah, it, it is wild when, like if you if someone's been arrested 20 or 30 times, it's you're obviously dealing with a career criminal. Right. That, that's someone that's someone who lives by crime. He's not he's not trying to get a steady job and be a productive member of society. This is someone who lives uh, and functions by crime. And it's like, OK, you had a theory when you were bringing this person in from another country. That I mean, you would assume that they want people who are going to be some sort of productive member of society. And so. Yeah, you okay, we got we brought someone in and all he wants to do is commit crimes. Yeah, I mean you'd think, okay, sorry about that. Bad pick. We we made a bad pick, but nope, it's not. It's uh the whole oh. mass migration enterprise was sold to Europeans on the basis of the lower birth rate in Europe and the idea that the migrants would come in and do the work that the uh aging native population was no longer able to cover. And uh, while whatever the merits of that argument may be, when you have a guy who's not working but living from crime to crime, he's clearly not benefiting the society, and it's nothing like what the migrant operation was sold to the people to do. He shouldn't be there. But in Norway, David, it's going in the opposite direction. Are you surprised? What's going on in Norway, Robert? Well, David, I'm glad you asked. In Norway, the uh, there is a 
group called the Equality Inclusion and Networks. I'm not sure. Maybe that's mistranslated. But in any case, uh, he's a former board member of the Islamic Council of Norway, Yasser Ahmed. And he found out that Ukrainian refugees from the war in Ukraine are given free public transportation. And so Yasser Ahmed demanded and received free public transportation for Muslim migrants in Norway. And so now if you are a Muslim migrant to Norway, you can get on any bus or subway or train and there is no problem, there is no cost. Now there nice. are some people in Norway who are not happy about that and they say, look, it's not an equivalent situation. The article that I've got from Jihad Watch says it is quite obvious that there's a difference between being in an active flight, that is fleeing a real war zone as in Ukraine, and being a resident with society's subsequent financial benefits mm -hmm. and access to welfare benefits. That these, the, the, the Muslim migrants have come from places, many of which are not war zones at all. And they've already been there for a while and presumably have jobs or should. And so there's really no reason to extend to them this favor but it does seem as if European governments are just bent on giving preferential treatment to the migrants. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, I mean, those are completely different situations. I mean, if, if, if you bring in some people from the Ukraine because there's a war going on there, you're basically you're, you're, you're basically giving them a safe place temporarily with the goal of sending them back once the war is over. So it's just, OK, these these are not these guys are not here to stay. We're just helping them stay alive while there's a war going on. Then they're going to go home. Uh, and so, yeah, it kind of makes sense to, okay, you're not here. You're not here long term. You're here until this stops. So let's help you out for a little while. But yeah, you got the, you know, you've got people coming in and they have no intention of ever going back to where they came from. Uh, and, and no intention of ever adapting and giving up all the benefits you're showering on them. In fact, those benefits are another incentive to get to these countries if you can, right? Like, hey, did you know, uh, hey, if we can get to this 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 country over here, we can commit all the crimes we want, we can rape all the girls we want, uh, and they'll pay, they'll, they'll give us free transportation no matter what we do, and uh, put us up in hotel, and it's like, my goodness. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like you're begging, please, by all means, come here. Come, mm -hmm. come, come over here. Yeah. yeah, you know, I don't think it's any coincidence, David, that the countries in Europe with the most generous welfare systems, Germany, France, UK, they have the biggest migrant problem right now. People are clamoring to get in and they do not have the will to get them out or to stop them from coming. And it's not a, it's not a coincidence. The, the, the Quran says the infidels pay the jizya with willing submission to the Muslims in lieu of the jizya you can you get these welfare benefits then that's just what the infidels ought to be doing supporting the muslims and so muslims go these to these countries and and this goes back to when we were talking about just basic common sense like if you're bringing in someone from afghanistan or pakistan might want to ask some questions about what this person believes about mm -hmm. uh, being around non-muslim uh, girls and so on uh, you, you could ask some very simple questions, but I mean, just imagine a situation where, OK, you're a migrant coming from a different country and you want to come to, you know, this European country. Totally fine. But uh, you're coming here. You're going to work. Nothing's going to be free. Uh, we, we can help you, you know, get get settled in if we need to or something like that. But other than that, you're going to be working and don't get in, don't get into trouble. Stay out of trouble. Stay out of trouble. Work hard. Pay your dues like everyone else. We'll treat you like everyone else here. Uh, those are the rules. And if you if you if you don't contribute, if you don't contribute, or you don't follow the law, then you, you're you're going back. Uh, so I mean that it, it would seem it, that would seem like pretty commonsensical, but nope, just not. Common sense never plays a role in these stories, David. In Sweden, we have the student association Ibn Rushd. Muslim Study Association, which has been shown to have links to the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is the infamous international organization 
that is dedicated to imposing Sharia, Islamic law, wherever possible around the world. And they have received 1.1 million Swedish kroner from the government. That's $106,500 in taxpayer money. And yet they are dedicated essentially to ultimately making Sweden into an Islamic state. Uh, there are many people, including, of course, the Sweden Democrats, who are quite upset about this. And yet there are others who believe that it will aid in the assimilation and accommodation of Muslims in the country, the new Swedes. Oh, it'll it'll uh, it'll aid some assimilation, just not in the direction they're they're <laughs> thinking. Here's the new Swede. Uh, the gentleman on the right in the picture is Mohammed Noor. And Mohammed Noor is the leader of a leftist party. And I know I'm going to say this wrong. It's called Tensta Rinkaby Spanga. Tensta Rinkaby Spanga. Tensta Rinkaby Spanga. Make a bird birdie. That's how they talk. Yes. And so, <laughs> yeah, when I was up there, I remember everybody, every last person. Sounded just like that. Anyway, Mohammed Noor has demanded, you know, we had the end of Ramadan since our last show, David, and so we missed Eid al-Fitr, and that is what he wants. Mohammed Noor has demanded that Eid al-Fitr become an official Swedish national holiday. And I think it's only a matter of time before that happens. What do you think, David? Oh, of course. I'm surprised it's not, I'm surprised it's not their national holiday already. Indeed. And the others already discarded. Uh, let's see. I had some. Oh, yeah, because you know, Christmas and Easter would be, would might hurt Muslim feelings. So you got to cancel all that stuff. Indeed. Also out of Sweden, in this uh, brave new Sweden that we have now, we have a uh, woman in her thirties was murdered in front of her children, stabbed thirty times. And uh, in this case, the stabs were all over her body. It seems that her husband did it. And he said that he did it in order to preserve the family's honor. Hmm. Seems like something we've heard before. Yes. Now, what is this all about, David? What does he possibly mean? Preserve the family's honors. You're surely this doesn't have anything to do with Islam, does it? Uh, well, you you've always had. Uh, I mean, you had honor shame societies and honor killings and so on that that you know go back even before Islam. But uh, it was very easy to adapt Islamic teachings to that in order to continue the practice. So you have. Uh, you have uh, commands like Surah 4, verse 65 in the Quran, which says that uh, if you don't submit fully to all of Muhammad's decisions and have no resistance against anything that Muhammad says, uh, you're not a real Muslim. You're, you're only a real Muslim if you completely submit to all of Muhammad's teachings. Uh, and then you have all these commands to kill people for apostasy. Uh, you have commands to wage jihad, uh, not only against unbelievers, but also against hypocrites. And you have in Sunan Ibn Majah, Muhammad commanding his followers to carry out Allah's penalties, even against their own family members. And so you kind of put all that together and it becomes incredibly easy to justify, hey, you uh, you did this, which is bad. You didn't dress appropriately. You didn't do this or that. Therefore, you're not living according to uh, our standards. Uh, and we're putting you in the uh, in the hypocrite or apostate category or something like that. And you have to die. And so it uh, just became easy to uh, to adapt this. Yes, indeed. Okay, David, another big story that I wanted to end up with. And this is out of Pakistan. It needs a little explaining to start with. There was a photo. I'm not going to show the photo because it turned out not to be pertaining to this story. And it rather obscured the story itself. But there was a photo that circulated on Twitter last week of a grave that actually had a grill over it and a padlock. And this was represented as being a grave in Pakistan that was padlocked because it would prevent necrophilia. And the 
photo went around and then uh, some fact checkers, and I have no reason to believe that the fact checkers are trustworthy. They usually aren't. But I also don't have any evidence to the contrary. In any case, they claim that the photo was not about necrophilia at all. It wasn't even in Pakistan, but was in India on a wealthy individual's grave. And apparently there's something he's buried with. So something valuable. So that's what the, the padlock is for. But the photo was really just a diversion and a kind of a uh, red herring because this past week, the Daily Times of Pakistan, not an Indian paper, not a infidel paper, not an Islamophobe, but the Daily Times of Pakistan published an editorial entitled Unsafe in Graves. And it started out like this, that a woman is raped every two hours in a country taking great pride in its family-oriented values has been hammered to the point of repetition in our collective conscience. But the heart-wrenching sight of padlocks on the graves of females is enough for the entire society to hang its head in shame. Pakistan Daily Times, April 28th, 2023. Now, David, surely this doesn't have anything to do with Islam, right? The padlocks on the graves of females? That must be some bizarre cultural hangover and nothing to do with the religion of peace, correct? I don't know. You got some creepy stuff in those sources, Robert. Yes, you do. Do you want to tell us or you want, I, I have it. I have them here. You, I mean, you, you have various things you, you have. Yes, go ahead. There was a, there's a story in Kansal Umal where, uh, uh, who yeah, was it? The, Ali. Yeah. Ali's, it right here. Who was it? Ali's mom who died yeah. or something like this? And he was all broken up about it because she was an unbeliever. And Muhammad said, well, you know, I'll, I'll go down and sleep with her. And it's something like, uh, so Muhammad climbs down into her grave and sleeps with her. And I've, I've heard, I can't, I can't verify this. This is just what I've heard. I've heard that the word for sleep with someone that's used is like our word and that it could refer to just, in theory, it could be just sleeping. Uh, but it's also like ours and sleeping with someone can refer to can refer to sex. But uh, what, whatever the case may be, Muhammad crawls down into the grave of a dead woman and says that, you know, this this is going to make her one of his wives in paradise or something like that. Uh, but there are some creepy, uh, creepy implications about whether he actually consummated that uh, relationship with a dead woman. Yeah, and whether uh, one thing that gives us some indication that he may have is the fact that there are teachings that our like that are that that suggest this. There's the passage from Mishkat Masabi, uh, where Anna says, "I was present when the daughter of Allah's messenger was being buried. He was sitting beside the grave, and I saw his eyes shedding tears." He then asked, is there any of you who did not have sexual intercourse last night? Abu Talha replied that he had not. So he, that is Muhammad, told him to go down into her grave, and he did so. Now here again, you don't have the explicit necrophilia reference, but it's made stronger by the question. Mm -hmm. Of course, Islamic apologists will say, no, he just means, is somebody ritually pure here? And so let's go on. Then you have a Sharia manual published in Egypt in 1983, Hawashi Ash-Sharwani, uh, by Abdul Hamid Ash-Sharwani, and he says, there is no need to rewash a dead woman if her husband has sex with her after she dies. And there's no punishment for anyone who has sex with a dead woman. Now that's likely to be a teaching that comes from the understanding that Muhammad did do this. Otherwise, these Islamic teachers would not be saying this. And uh, another one, Muhammad al-Sherbini, there's no restriction against sex with a dead woman or an animal. Yeah, it's uh, if you if you bring that up now, you'll get, oh, no, Islam doesn't teach this at all. Give him another five years and Daniel Hakikachu will be defending it in debate. <laughs> Yeah, I heard he was defending child marriage. So yeah, you're yeah, quite so, right. Yeah, it's 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 basically everything that we were saying about Islam 15 years ago, uh, and they called us liars for, is now being is now being actively 
promoted and bragged about. And so if we point out something like this, then yeah, give them five years and it'll be Daniel Hakikachu versus inspiring philosophy. Is it okay to, uh, to have sex with a corpse? Oh my goodness. It boggles the mind, David. It's just incredible. Pretty, pretty creepy. Yes. And it does actually, uh, once again, give the impression of a demonic origin to all this. As, uh, Jesus says in the Gospel of John that there was a time that men will think that men will kill you and think that they're offering service to God. And of course, the passage in Isaiah about woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Islam seems to be in so many ways the embodiment of that. And so we have come to the end of another scintillating hour of this week in jihad. Uh, we can hope that there will be no jihad next week. We might even be a half week if we get a chance, if we can work it back into Wednesday. We'll have uh, maybe a short show, but there's likely to be some jihad till then. So keep your head down, keep alert, and may God bless you all.